So um, th this is a presentation on, on the 2019 uh, coronavirus. It's based on a slide deck of training slides um, that, that we've been using uh, for running a number of trainings um, throughout uh, South Africa to, to a number of different sectors. Um, the brief for this presentation was that it's really focused um, on clinicians in the frontline, general practitioners and frontline uh, clinicians. And so um, we're going to focus on more on the slides that are relevant to clinicians. But, but just to be aware, there, there is a large slide deck. I'll skip over some of uh, the, the slides, but um, there's a lot more information in the slide deck, um, you know, if you want to go through it. And the slide deck, you know, will be made available after the presentation. So just as an outline of the presentation, um, we'll be starting off um, covering the microbiology, the epidemiology, and the clinical presentation of this disease. Um, and then we're gonna uh, move on to, to the surveillance, the case definitions, the laboratory diagnosis, um, and, and a little bit about infection prevention and control. The last two bullets, which are really patient flow and actions and coordinating a public health response, we will skip through those. Some of those, those slides are really in the deck uh, more for for your information um, and we'll see how far we get I do I do want to um, in you know make sure we have time to address all of your questions so I will skip over some of the slides to rather see what you've written um, on on the presentation I see people are raising hand and I, I would if it's I'm hoping somebody's checking that we actually can hear me but assuming that you can hear if the sound is going through rather send a send a, a note on the comments, not raise your hand because we won't be able to manage 300 uh, comments. Okay, so, so the first thing to say, and I'm sure you'll all be aware because I'm sure you've all been tracking um, this outbreak uh, you know, through the media and through our website, the situation is rapidly evolving. <coughs> Today I'm gonna give you the latest of what we know, but we know that, that the situation will change, perhaps even while I'm speaking and certainly over the weekend. And so you should always check our website www.nicd.ac.za uh, for the updates, especially for South Africa specific information like guidelines and case definitions. Um, but there's also on this, this page information from WHO and then places to find a sort of more general information about COVID-19. So, so to start off, um, and, and I'm gonna go quite quickly through this because as I understand the audience are mostly doctors, coronaviruses are a large family of viruses. The name comes from the spikes on the surface uh, that look like a, a crown. Um, and and um, th there are a number of, of coronaviruses that cause disease in humans, as well as uh, coronaviruses that are found in animals. And the four coronaviruses uh, that are listed on the slide um, are normal causes of, of colds and flu and sometimes uh, pneumonia um, in humans. Um, but what we do know uh, historically is that uh, it can happen, and it has happened in the past, that, that coronaviruses that are normally found um, in animals can undergo uh, modifications to the genetic sequence that, that affects their, their, their phenotype and that allows them to uh, infect humans um, and also cause uh, illness uh, in humans. Um, and this has happened uh, before in the past uh, with two previous uh, instances. The first in 2002 was the severe acute respiratory syndrome outbreak in China. Uh, this virus is an extremely close relative of, of the virus we're going to be talking about uh, today. Um, and it also caused pneumonia, a more severe pneumonia with a 10% case fatality. This virus um, was in fact contained and eliminated uh, from the, the, the planet following a sustained outbreak with many cases. And more recently, we have the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome uh, coronavirus emerged in the late 2000s in, in the Middle East. Uh, cam camels are the vector and it causes a severe pneumonia in humans. It has caused outbreaks in humans and it still uh, causes sporadic disease, but it did not give rise to any global outbreaks such as we're seeing with the current uh, epidemic. So what is this virus? Um, so so, so COVID-19, um, it all really started uh, certainly in terms of the, the knowledge of the international community on the 31st of December last year uh, when the World Health Organization uh, China Country Office reported um, a cluster of cases of pneumonia in Wuhan, Hubei province uh, of China. Um, and at that time, they, they, they didn't know what the cause of the, the outbreak was, but they, they picked it up as an unusual event. And, and very rapidly and quite impressively, the Chinese scientists were able to identify the causative pathogen as a novel cor coronavirus. Just a note on terminology. Um, in the beginning, it was called the novel coronaviruses, and then World Health Organization convened a meeting uh, you know, on nomenclature. And it's a bit of a confusing name, but the name of the virus is called SARS coronavirus 2. Um, and, and the reason it has this name is because it's very, very closely related to the, the SARS virus that caused the outbreak in 2002. 
Um, but the, the, the WHO decided to give a, a different name to the illness caused by the virus. So the illness caused by the virus is called Coronavirus Disease 2019, and the acronym for that is COVID-19. So if you're talking about a patient who's ill, then they're ill with COVID-19, but they're infected by the SARS coronavirus 2 uh, virus. So initially, um, you know, with any emerging outbreak like this, the, the key questions are, can it spread efficiently uh, between people and is it therefore a global uh, threat? And initially the cases were related to this market in Wuhan, but very rapidly information emerged that this virus does in fact uh, spread efficiently between people. And this made the world take notice and understand that this was a potential a threat, you know, more widely than just uh, in China. So this is the, the epidemic curve um, from a few days ago um, from the cases outside China. I think just as a brief epidemiologic uh, update, if you think back to a few weeks in the early stages of, of the epidemic, initially the epidemic uh, was in Hubei, China predominantly, very large epidemic, um, certainly from the reports we see on the media, you know, extreme stress placed on the health system. Um, due to this outbreak in, in Wuhan in China. And the Chinese government imposed a very strong and in fact unprecedented measures to control this outbreak in terms of really quarantining uh, you know, many millions of people in Wuhan and the surrounding uh, cities uh, in an attempt to stop the spread um, of, of the virus. Um, and, and, and so early on, there was, there was a big epidemic in, in, in Wuhan and, and with exportation to a number of cities in China. And then in more, more recently, over the last uh, two weeks, in fact, uh, the, the, the outbreak in China has, has started to die down. Numbers of cases reported from China and, and Wuhan are decreasing every day. But what we see on this slide is, is the area of, of current relevance, which is the, the epidemic curve of confirmed cases reported outside of China. So, so um, it seems that these very strong measures that they took in China have, have certainly damped down the epidemic in China. But what, what does seem to have happened is that the travelers initially from China, but now um, you know, from a number of other parts of the world where there is local transmission, have been seeding this virus into various countries of the world, leading to um, you know, with every day really new countries reporting uh, cases uh, of the infection with the, the virus, and in some cases clusters uh, of transmission within the country, and also in some countries, uh, you, perhaps not identifying the first case, but later these countries identifying, uh, you know, more a community outbreak um, where perhaps the, the initial case was missed. And it's this epidemic curve that you see on the slide, this really alarming increase in, in numbers of cases um, from many different countries through, through a number of different regions um, in the world that, that, that is the reason for the ongoing uh, concern. Um, you'll see on this graph that although Africa does appear, it's, very, it's a tiny sliver that you can't even see on the graph, uh, Africa so far has been relatively spared um, with regard to this virus. And there are a number of factors. One um, is certainly Africa is, is less connected than other areas of the world like the United States um, and, and Europe. Um, and there also could be an element of, of less uh, capacity to, to detect the virus uh, you know, on the continent. So, so re really critical to our assessment of the, the risk um, related to this virus is, is this, this factor of transmissibility. So, so before they, um, you know, when the virus first emerged, uh, there was a hope that in fact it wasn't an efficient spreader between people, but now we know that it spreads uh, efficiently between people. It's very important, the main route of transmission is through respiratory droplets, um, and I'll talk a little bit later about the controls for this. There, there is uh, investigation into whether it can be uh, transmitted through the stool. The virus is found in the stool, um, but uh, nobody so far has actually cultured live virus from the stool. So, so fecal oral transmission is a possibility, but it's not uh, proven at this time. And there's also no evidence of, to support airborne uh, transmission. Um, so, so there were a few early studies uh, looking at the transmission of this virus. The, the mean incubation period is, is five, about five days, um, between four and seven would be the average. And, and the 95% the, the percentile of the distribution on, on this study, which was a large early study, was 12.5 days. And, and it's this uh, incubation period, which is the interval between acquisition of infection and onset of signs and symptoms, um, that is the basis for our recommendation of 14 days of isolation or quarantine in people who have potentially been exposed to the virus. Because essentially it's based on this, this evidence and other studies on transmission that say 
that, that if you are infected by day 12, probably, or 13, you should have shown signs and symptoms. And if you haven't shown signs and symptoms by then, then you're not infected. And in the 14 days, it's just to add a little bit of, of, of safety onto that estimate. Um, th this virus, uh, in the early stages, the epidemic doubled in size every seven days. And this is slower than a virus like flu. Flu would be more like uh, two every two days. Um, so, so although it spreads quite well, it, it evolves over a slightly longer uh, time period than, than influenza evolves. And, and the basic reproductive number, which is the measure of how infectious the virus is, um, it, uh, and defined as really the average number of secondary cases that each infectious case gives rise to, is just over two. So between two and three. It's all, so if you have one case, they'll infect two to three other cases, and each of them will infect two to three additional cases. And, and this is this exponential growth over the generations, each seven days apart, is what gives rise to these explosive epidemics that we see. Very importantly for this virus, and it was described also for SARS and the MERS coronavirus, is that we also do see what we call super spreading events. Super spreading events are when in a subset of individuals, um, for, for some reason, and it's not entirely known, probably a combination of factors, Firstly, host factors, it's so the infected individual probably for some reason sheds the virus at much higher levels, and also probably environmental uh, factors. So, so if the person is in an environment where there's lots of prolonged close contact or a ventilation system that spreads the virus or in healthcare settings, so environmental factors that support it, the combination of these events lead to, in a subset of cases, instances where one person may infect many more than two to three cases, even in the in tens or twenties or, or hundreds of secondary cases. And some examples of this, the most uh, pro prominent example is the Diamond Princess cruise liner in Japan, but there are a number of other examples of, of super spreading events, uh, you know, ski resorts, uh, conferences, etc. And this is classic of, of coronaviruses, but it also uh, complicates our attempts to control uh, the virus when, when we have, uh, in addition to, you know, just regular cases infecting a small number of people, these occasional events where very large numbers of people uh, can be affected by one uh, initial case. So, so when we assess, you know, what is the risk to the world um, of a virus uh, like this, um, th there's really two key factors. The first is transmissibility, um, you know, how efficiently does it spread? And as I've said to you, this virus uh, spreads efficiently. And the, the second uh, really important factor that we need to consider is, is the, the seriousness of disease, because that's really how we, we judge what will be the potential impact um, of this virus were it to give rise to widespread uh, community transmission. So, so this slide uh, it, uh, is a little old. There have been one or two uh, papers published more recently um, with case series of, of patients from China, but the, the basic findings uh, you know, are the same. The, the majority of patients present with fever and cough are the commonest symptoms or shortness of breath, but essentially cases can present as any uh, mild respiratory illness and signs and symptoms can be quite non-specific in the early stages with, with myalgia and malaise, but, but most patients will have some uh, signs, the vast majority, that localize the illness to the respiratory system. But clinically, this infection cannot be distinguished from influenza or other uh, types of colds and flu. What is reassuring is that 80% um, of cases are mild. Um, and 20% are, are described as being severe, but the majority of severe cases either are elderly or they have severe underlying illnesses that would uh, put them at risk of, of severe disease. And this is reassuring because it suggests that this virus behaves like other respiratory uh, pathogens that we know, like influenza or the pneumococcus. Um, and, and so it doesn't appear to be causing severe disease in healthy adults. And very importantly, not on the slide, but, but a lot of more recent data has shown that, that children, for a reason that is not understood yet, appear to be relatively spared. So, so well under 5% of cases from all the series from, from in China and also the exported cases out of China have been children. So to date, the evidence suggests that for some reason, children, which is in contrast to, to influenza, for example, appear to be relatively spared from disease. What is unclear is whether they are perhaps being infected asymptomatically uh, or very mildly symptomatically or whether children are actually not uh, getting the infection. And I think there's research ongoing to try and address that. Um, now, you know, every day, if you follow the numbers, the numbers of cases and deaths reported globally continue to increase. Um, but if we, we look at the, the statistics, it, it varies a little bit, but it's about 1% to 2% of reported cases um, have died. 
Um, and, and what we see is that, as I said, critically ill cases, the elderly people with underlying illnesses have a, have a, a high mortality. Now, th there's a, a challenge, though, in terms of, of extrapolating from this 1% to 2% about, you know, the question of is this virus more or less severe than, than seasonal flu. Seasonal flu would have a case fatality ratio of, of well under 1%. And the reason why it's difficult to, to assess this is because we know that in, in any setting, really, uh, severe cases and deaths uh, are more likely to be ascertained and diagnosed than mild cases in the community. So, so if you, if you, um, you know, are, are missing a lot of the mild cases, then, then when you calculate your case fatality ratio, you'll divide all the deaths out of, uh, you know, a subset of the mild cases, and therefore you'll overestimate the case fatality ratio. Um, and so, um, it's not clear, um, you know, as yet really how severe um, th this virus is, but, but there are concerns, you know, that, that, it, that it may be somewhat more severe than seasonal influenza, although certainly not to the levels um, of SARS or MERS or, or, or H1N1 in, 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 the, in the pandemic in 1918. Um, and I think this is really a critical area that the global community is trying to, to address to get more robust data on how uh, severe this virus um, actually is. So in terms of surveillance and case definitions, um, so this is really important if those of you who hopefully many of you are uh, general practitioners out there, this is our, uh, what we call the case definition for persons under investigation. So this is who we are recommending should be tested for the virus. Um, so firstly, anyone with acute respiratory illness, whether it's severe or mild, um, and has in the 14 days prior to the onset of symptoms met one of the epidemiologic criteria. And the epidemiologic criteria are the critical ones. Either they were in close contact with a confirmed or probable case, or they had a history of travel to areas with presumed ongoing community transmission of the virus, or they worked in or attended a healthcare facility where patients were being treated. Now, the difficult one and the one that changes all the time is the areas with ongoing community transmission of the virus. And for this, you need to check our website all the time because we're updating the list all the time. So the real hotspots in the world right now are Italy, South Korea, and, uh, and Iran. You know, those are the countries that have been exporting lots of countries all over the world, but there are a number of other countries like Japan, uh, you know, now uh, coming up, uh, there's suggestions in the USA um, where community transmission is occurring. And so we monitor the global situation and update, um, update these guidelines. Uh, so, so we're not testing everyone from a, case, from a country that's reported just one case. For example, in South Africa, we've had our, our, our first case reported yesterday, but that case has been contained and the contacts are being followed up and there's no suggestion that there's widespread community transmission of the virus in South Africa. So if somebody uh, travels to South Africa and they stay in Joburg and then they go back to another country, you know, they, we certainly, I don't think there's, there's evidence to assume that they, they could have acquired the infection in South Africa. And it's the same, we apply this, this to other countries. So if a country's had one or two cases that are contained, that's not ongoing community transmission. Um, but, but in the places where it's spreading in the community and we think people could actually have, have picked it up, then those are the ones that we focus our testing on. And then the third uh, criterion is, and this is really aimed to broaden our sensitivity to make sure we don't miss cases. Anyone who's admitted with a severe pneumonia of unknown etiology, we are happy to also test them. And um, we do acknowledge that, you know, in many countries of the world, um, the, 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 it appears from the evidence that there may have been instances where the, the, the initial primary case was not identified, but now they're seeing transmission in the country. And so, so certainly the, this, um, uh, you know, last criterion of a person with severe pneumonia of unknown etiology, irrespective of travel history, um, it will, will just increase our sensitivity to pick up should there be uh, some local transmission. Um, just, just on that note, um, we, we also, um, from, from next week, going to be starting testing on our routine respiratory illness surveillance programs that we run for flu in a number of provinces of the country. We'll start testing on those platforms for the coronavirus, and that will be another way that we can be more sensitive uh, to, to pick up should it happen that there is a community transmission um, so, that, so that we can you know, really be on top of it and, and monitor the situation in real time. So if you have a patient who's a person under investigation, going back to the slide, this is the slide you need to know if you're a frontline health practitioner. And just lastly to say, um, we, we know that there may be areas of, of clinical suspicion. You may not be, the person may have had a specific high risk transmission that you're worried about. Uh, it, it comes later in the presentation. We have our hotline for, for healthcare workers. And if you are worried about a patient, uh, we, 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 and it, there's a good justification for it, we are happy to test them. So you can phone our, our doctor on call hotline. But just 
just to highlight the hotline is inundated with questions. We have uh, uh, two or three doctors working 24 seven on the hotline um, and we are there to support your clinical queries, um, but also just to use that line re responsibly beca because it's inundated query. So absolutely, if you have a patient you're worried about, you must phone and we are happy to discuss it with you and we will attest, um, but certainly don't refer patients or members of the public to that line. There is a number which will come up later for members of the public. If testing is indicated, what next? Um, so, so the first thing to do is to um, isolate the patient uh, using appropriate infection prevention and control. I'll go through that. Then you must collect a specimen and you must urgently transfer it to us at the NICD for testing. And then you need to, if the patient meets our case definition, you need to start and get the contact tracing going. And that means uh, as you take the, the specimen, you need to inform the patient. You are a person under investigation. You could potentially have the virus. You should go home and not uh, mix with people until such time as we've excluded the, the diagnosis. And before they leave your rooms, you should fill in our form. And I'm going to show it to you a little bit later and ask them to, to think back to, to their close contacts. Um, in the last seven days, and you should list, they should give you the names of all of them, and if they have phone numbers for them, you should make that list and start that list uh, for us, uh, for the contact tracing. Um, and, and should the patient then be positive, the Department of Health, uh, together with the NICD, will then use that list to start the, the contact tracing. Obviously, if we do have a positive case, we'll also perform a repeat interview of the, the patient to make sure that that contact line list is, is is comprehensive, but it's very important uh, when you identify the person under investigation to also identify the context so that it doesn't delay the investigation should the patient uh, turn out to be positive. And, and I must say, all of this was really beautifully done for, for our first case that we had yesterday. We had all the information and the line list uh, filled in. So who is a close contact? It's any person who's had face-to-face -face contact within two meters or was in a closed environment with a case, including all persons living in the same house, people working closely in the same environment, a healthcare worker or other person providing direct care, a contact in an aircraft sitting within two seats in either direction of the COVID-19 uh, case, travel companions or persons providing care. Um, very important for healthcare workers, um, you know, it's really the person providing direct care, so, so, so not everybody in the, in the building, even if they were in another room or out on the other side of the room, etc. cetera. So, so and that's one area where we do have to communicate um, about healthcare workers. But certainly, should the patient be a case, we will, um, when we follow up on the context, we'll also confirm that they are true, a close context and make sure there aren't any that we've missed. So, so just in terms of occupational exposure, close contacts should be advised to remain at home. And this is only close contacts uh, once we've confirmed the case. This is what will happen to the context if we've confirmed the case. They should remain at home, so not while it's a person under investigation, once it's a confirmed case. They remain at home, avoid unnecessary social contact, avoid travel, remain reachable. And then for healthcare workers, um, should there be a, a case in, in, a, in a hospital setting, for example, uh, the health facility be, will be required to, to compile lists of healthcare workers with an occupational exposure, uh, and then they, they will all need to be actively monitored for symptoms and isolated should symptoms uh, develop. So just a slide on quarantine. I, I'm a bit short of time, so I'm going to run through, but I'll just touch on quarantine. Quarantine means separating asymptomatic people who are exposed to a disease from non-exposed uh, people, and it's to be distinguished from isolation, which we're much more comfortable as health practitioners, which is when we separate a sick person uh, from healthy individuals who, who don't have the disease. So isolation, I think we all are used to doing. Quarantine is something we don't often use in our public health armamentarium. It's really only in, in, in extreme events like this, we reduce quarantine. They can slow the spread. Um, just to be clear, quarantine can be at home or in a facility. Um, and, and it can be voluntary or it can be compelled. There does exist legislation that can compel people to be quarantined um, should they pose a risk uh, to society. And it, it, it could be in different settings. So if, if a person's very, very high risk, for example, the, the people that are going to be repatriated from, from Wuhan, they'll be kept in a designated facility for 14 days. But our recommendation for household members of a confirmed case will be that they stay in their home uh, for 14 days. So they self-quarantine um, at home. For healthcare workers, if they're wearing appropriate PPE, then they would be allowed to work. But they should self-quarantine if they have symptoms. But if, for example, they did an aerosol generating procedure and they didn't have appropriate PPE, that would be a situation where, where they would be treated as a close contact and asked to self-isolate. It's very important that we, we, for healthcare workers, we stick carefully to the guidelines in terms of who needs to quarantine and not because, uh, you know, otherwise we could rapidly have a situation where, where our health system is depleted of health workers who, who actually haven't had the type of risk that, that, that requires them to quarantine. 
This is the contact line list that you should fill in. Um, if you have a, a, a person on investigation, it's at the top of the details of the case, and then there's a place just to list all the contacts um, that should be there. And there's another form which is not, uh, for some reason I don't have a slide of it, um, but there's a second uh, laboratory slip uh, that needs to be completed and a person under investigation form that needs to be completed and all of those are on our website and if you phone our hotline which you should phone our hotline if you if you are sending a specimen to us you must phone the hotline um you know they'll, they'll tell you the forms you need to fill in but also on our website all the forms uh, are there so there's a lab slip there's a person under investigation form which is a bit more information about the case so that when they if they turn out to be positive we can get going and then the contact line list and this is just a flow chart that really shows, you know, what we do uh, with the case. A little bit on laboratory diagnostics. Um, we, we should only be testing persons on investigation. So people in the general community with flu-like illness, we're not going to test them unless they've got one of those risk factors. This is the NICD doctor on call number. You must phone the number if you're sending us a sample so that we know what's happening. You must take the sample rapidly. You must transport it. If you're in the private sector, the private sector has systems in place to get the samples to us rapidly. If you're in the public sector, all the NHLS laboratories throughout South Africa have systems in place to get it to us. You get it to your local lab, they will get it to us at the NICD. And you must manage the patient as potentially infected. So if you have a person under investigation, you must isolate them. If they're mild, you can send them home to self-isolate. If they're severe, you need to admit them, but you need to manage them as a potential uh, case um, until such time as we have the results. For, for the patient, the, the first case that we had, this was all done uh, very well. But I think you as frontline healthcare workers should be thinking with every case, if you think they need testing, they could be a positive case. And you need to make sure everything's done correctly until we have that negative result back. Okay, low respiratory tract samples are preferred. If a person has a pneumonia, we really need a low respiratory tract sample, otherwise we can't exclude the diagnosis. Um, but if they have mild illness, you can take a combined nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swab. Please put them in the same tube, otherwise we need to run two separate PCRs and waste two kits. So two nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal in the same tube um, and then if you can get sputum or other low respiratory tract samples, you should do them. Serum, we're not recommending as a diagnostic test. When we have confirmed cases, however, we are taking uh, a serum and blood to understand uh, the, the evolution of the immune response in a bit more detail. You should use universal or viral transport medium for swabs if available. This is the best. But if you can't, you can use a gel swab. And if you don't have a swab in gel, a dry swab will also be accepted. I'm going to flick through these slides. This is just all the equipment, how to take a swab. You can look on our website. All the information is there. I've said for the transport, uh, you need to get it to your lab. They should know how to label it, but the labeling is also here. And, and there are systems in place from all the labs in South Africa to get it to us at the NICD. Uh, so, so just to, and it's free of charge for patients meeting the case definitions above. Just a note on lab testing. The plan is from next week going forward, lab TP testing will be rolled out to laboratories more broadly than the NICD. There are some private sector laboratories that have already set up the assay and are planning to, to start uh, running tests from early next week. Um, and there are also uh, other laboratories in the National Health Laboratory Service that are getting the assay up and running. So, so currently we have fully centralized testing. We will move to, to decentralized testing over the coming weeks, but it is still essential that you follow all the procedures and fill in all the relevant forms and that we get the data from all the other testing laboratories so that should we have a positive case, all the information is in place for us to start that, that follow up uh, very rapidly. So, so if, if it's in a private laboratory, you would still have to notify the case on the notify or medical condition system and fill in all the relevant forms and send them through to us, whether it's been tested at Lancet or Empath or any other private lab or at the NHLS or at the NICD. Okay, so the forms you need, the specimen submission form and the case investigation form on our website. You know, you put it in a Ziploc bag, you label it and you send it. There's not special precautions. It's like any other uh, sample you'd be sending for a respiratory virus panel. This is our person under investigation form, um, and there may be a later version. So the best thing is to download the latest uh, version uh, from the, the website. These are some contact details uh, for people that you can ask questions about. What is the test we do? It's a reverse transcriptase PCR reaction. The turnaround time is 24 hours from receipt of the sample. 
And we do do more, more in-depth analysis on positive samples, but that's more for, for research and understanding the, the virus. Um, we, we, are, we started off with an in-house PCR before there were kits uh, available based on published sequences. Now we are using commercial kits. There are a number of different commercial kits available, and we, we, we use uh, different ones. For the testing, we are an international reference laboratory, and so we also uh, test and validate uh, different kits for different countries, and we also provide a, a resource to, to other countries in Africa as a reference uh, laboratory. Very important, a negative result does not rule out the possibility of infection in a patient in whom you really very highly suspect there could be a case. Um, so if it's a poor specimen quality, it was collected at the wrong time, it wasn't shipped appropriately, um, and if you really, really strongly suspect a patient with severe pneumonia who's with strong travel history and you don't have any other diagnosis, you, you should uh, submit a repeat uh, a sample. Um, also to, to, to mention, there is no test that can exclude infection in incubation period. So we do not test asymptomatic people because even if they are negative, it does not mean that they will not go on to become positive. So, so please don't ask us to test asymptomatic or healthy people. Um, the time is limited, but in just a bit on infection prevention and control. Um, so I've said it's direct contact and droplet transmission. Airborne is, is questionable and not uh, proven. Um, the key principles are a safe environment can be achieved through elimination on the air and on surfaces, and your, it's your classic uh, criteria of infection control, your administrative control, so decrease the number of particles, remove from the air and surfaces, which are, is your environmental, and then your personal protective equipment um, and your risk uh, reduction. You should ensure triage, early recognition, and source control of patients. So we are telling people who think they might have the virus, they should call ahead to the facility and, and tell them, I think I might have the coronavirus. And, and then obviously they would expect the, the, the GP or the, the practice to, to then put in place measures. So if you know Mr. So-and-so is coming and he's, he's been in Italy and he's now coughing badly, you should make sure that your receptionist knows when this person comes in, they should be given a surgical mask, they should be taken to a private room, they should be attended to quickly, they should not sit in your waiting room exposing a, a lot of other people. Um, so we're really trying to get the message out there to the general public that they should call ahead so that we don't have transmission events in, in, the, in the rooms of, of practices. Um, you should apply standard precautions for all patients um, and then additional precautions uh, for, for suspected cases, which is droplet and contact. Um, so, so I think there's the environmental engineering and the administrative uh, con controls. But just to say, um, we, we, there's a lot of issue about shortage of, of N95 masks. N95 masks are really only needed for aerosol generating procedures. There is not evidence that this virus is, is, uh, is an airborne Virus. So, so a normal mask, goggles, a gloves, a gown, uh, you know, your, your contact and droplet precautions are fine unless you are doing an aerosol generating procedure. If you're doing an aerosol generating procedure, you should use a fit tested N95 uh, mask. But it's not needed for every for changing the patient's bedpan or, or general nursing or, or other uh, procedures. In all facilities, you should have screening for cough respiratory symptoms and travel history at the entrance. You should put up a sign to tell people with the travel history, and this is outdated, not just China, any of the affected countries, to identify themselves. You should provide surgical masks to people who sneeze or cough, and you should see persons with symptoms first, and you should encourage hand hygiene amongst patients and healthcare workers. This is really about hand hygiene. We'll go through quickly, because I want to have a little bit of time to go through uh, the questions. Um, uh, this is about contact and droplet uh, and all the details. And then, so, so this is about when do you need airborne precautions, sputum specimen or a nasopharyngeal swab. This is where you need your airborne, which is your N95 uh, mask. And a ventilated patient in the ICU, you should use an N95 mask. But in other normal circumstances, doing the interview, uh, et cetera, even drawing blood, those kinds of things, you don't need your N95 mask. Always use gland, goggles, face shield, um, and then you should train in IPC. And then just to say, you should refer to the World Health Organization guideline. There's an excellent guideline on infection prevention and control, and it's essential that this should be distributed to all the facility, uh, all the staff in your facility, and, and this guideline will be updated regularly. Should there be new information about the transmission, this guideline will be updated. So I think it's very important uh, you know, to make sure you're up to date with the latest guidance for infection prevention and control and the evidence uh, for that. And this is the last slide. There are a lot more in the deck. I'm not gonna go through them. I'm gonna go to questions. There's a checklist. If you want to know if your facility is ready, if you're working in a, in a larger practice or, or a hospital, there's a facility readiness checklist, and it's got all the different components that you should think about um, in terms of your facility readiness. And it can be really uh, useful to, to make you, you feel confident that you're prepared or help you identify gaps that you should then 
address. And now I'm going to ask my IT support to show me how I can find the questions online. So thanks, everyone. I hope you've posted your questions. I do have to leave. We've got about 20 minutes for questions and answers. Let me just try to do it myself because I'm going to have to do it unless you want to do it for me. Okay. Okay. So I hope everyone can hear me. Um, we've got sound, yeah? So I'm just, we, we've got 300 people and about 700 questions. Um, and I'm going to, and, and it is being recorded. Will you make it available? Yes, we will make the recording available on the website or you can email. It will be on the NICD website. So there's a lot of questions about recording. The, the, the session will be on the NICD website. I'm just trying to scroll through this. There's so many things um, to get to some actual uh, questions. Uh, a lot of you had no audio. I hope you do have audio now. Okay, why is it a notifiable disease? Okay, so I'm going to just go through them as I go. There are lots of them. We'll see how far we get. Why is it a notifiable disease? So, so the, the reason, that the justification for diseases to be notifiable um, medical conditions is if they represent a substantial public health threat in terms of, condition, of, of transmission and there are specific containment measures that are recommended for each case and, and that need the Department of Health to know about the case so that they can respond to and act um, on the case. So, so at this stage, we are in the containment phase of the virus. That means that the global World Health Organization recommended strategy as well as our strategy within South Africa is that should we have a confirmed case, the aim is to contain and limit the spread from that case. And that means we will follow up actively on all the contacts and isolate them and test them. Now, there the are two goals to containment. The, the most ambitious goal is that if we really, really are very effective with containment, we could completely stamp out the outbreak and, and, and keep the country out of, the, the, the illness out of South Africa. Um, but, but even if we, containment is not totally effective, we see countries like the United States where containment was certainly effective in the initial stages, now they are seeing limited uh, community transmission. All the global uh, leaders agree that if we, we, we continue these containment measures, they will hopefully at least slow the spread of the virus uh, through the country. So, so some of you may be skeptically thinking, why are we trying to contain it? Because um, it's not gonna be contained. But containment in, cer in certain settings, it has been very effective. There are countries that have had a number of cases where now they don't have transmission um, anymore and they have contained it. So it can be effective in some settings. And um, it's even, even though the WHO is acknowledging now, I think more and more that, that total containment globally is, is unlikely, um, they are still recommending each country should really try and contain the individual cases so that they slow the spread. Why is slowing the spread so important? Because we know that respiratory diseases like this one um, can, as you saw from that epidemic curve that I showed you globally, can give rise to very, very rapid uh, spread. And you, get, you can get an epidemic curve with a very rapid upturn and a very rapid downturn. And what that could mean is that even if the disease is relatively mild, say similar to seasonal influenza, um, or even milder than that, if because of, there's no immunity in the population and it spreads so fast, if, if the numbers of cases increase so rapidly all at one point in time, even if it's not really such a severe disease, this could lead to overwhelming of the health system and, and just not having enough beds and ventilators in that short few weeks when the most cases are there um, for us to be able to cope. And so these containment measures are designed to slow the spread and try and flatten the epidemiologic curve to give us more time over which the cases and can occur and take the pressure off the health system. Contact tracing is just one of the containment measures. There are other things that we could consider. Lots of things have been done um, you know, throughout the world, uh, ranging from closing businesses, teleworking, uh, even our, our measures such as communicating about hand washing and cough hygiene. Those are all containment measures that could be used to slow the spread. Obviously, uh, you know, should there be an outbreak in South Africa, we would have to assess the situation on an ongoing basis and decide what types of, of containment measures are, are, are warranted, given the severity of the outbreak, um, you know, to, to try to slow the spread. So that's the reason it's notifiable, um, because there are specific public health actions that need to be taken for every case, and the Department of Health need to know about this, even the suspected cases, um, so that they can take appropriate um, action. Uh, now, there's lots of things about muting and sound. Are neonates relatively spared like children, or is this not yet known? There is uh, very limited uh, publications on, on pediatric disease. There's one case series, I think it was in JAMA Pediatrics, um, uh, describing a disease 
immunates. Um, certainly, it seems in terms of the attack rates, uh, all children are relatively spared, including uh, neonates. Um, I think what is not clear is whether should neonates become infected, um, are they, uh, you know, are they likely to develop more uh, severe illness than others? I think that the data are too too limited uh, uh, for that. Um, and of course, with neonates, um, it, it's always uh, you need to be sure whether the, the low numbers are about lack of exposure or, or, or actual lack of susceptibility. So I think for neonates, the data is is emerging. Are there asymptomatic carriers? It's a very very um, important question. I think um, the, the Diamond Princess event on the cruise liner in, in Japan showed us very clearly that people can be completely asymptomatic and have the virus present uh, in the nose. So there were uh, several hundred cases identified on the cruise liner and uh, almost half of them were, were asymptomatic. So, so you can be completely healthy and have the virus in the nose. It is not known at all scientifically what that means, whether it means that you are incubating the illness and will go on to develop signs and symptoms, and whether it means that you can transmit the virus on, and how long that asymptomatic carrier state lasts. None of those things are known, but we know that you can asymptomatically have the virus in the nose. What we also know is that there are some few small number of reports in the literature that suggest that transmission from asymptomatic individuals may occur. It is not clear um, how common this is, but what we know from all other respiratory viruses is that if transmission from asymptomatic carriers does occur, it is likely much less efficient uh, than transmission from symptomatic people because it is the symptoms, the runny nose, the cough, that also uh, allow people to be able to transmit more efficiently. So it is possible, and there's some suggestive evidence, but not totally conclusive that asymptomatic people could possibly transmit the virus, but this would not be the major route that is leading to spread in our communities. By far, the main source of, of transmission would be uh, ill people because it's the symptoms that really help the virus to, to, to spread um, more efficiently. Um, so, and again, that's a very evolving area of, of research, and I think over the coming days, there'll be a lot more data. Should all returning travelers show a detailed travel itinerary reports of entry so that those can be isolated immediately? So the answer to that is, is no. Um, that, that's just not practical. Just, just, and also, it, it's not warranted in terms of the restriction on movement of people. So our recommendation for people traveling from countries where there is community transmission, like Italy, etc., is that these people should actively self-monitor themselves for symptoms and should they develop any symptoms at all, they should immediately self-isolate and go uh, for testing. The basis is what I've just said about the fact that asymptomatic individuals are extremely unlikely uh, to transmit the virus. Um, and, and, and even in, in, in many of, of the countries where there is transmission, the actual chance of getting infected um, is, 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 is very low because it's out of millions of people, really. You may have a few hundred cases. So our current recommendation, and that is in line with a number of other countries in the world, is that if you've been in a high incidence country, you, you should uh, really monitor yourself actively. If there's any concern about symptoms, you should immediately self-isolate and go uh, for testing. But we're not offering, we're not recommending that people um, be isolated uh, immediately. Um, and yes, so the next question is only direct context should be investigated. Yes, so, so this is very important. We had a lot of queries about context of context. And um, so, so it's the close contacts of the case that need to be isolated and tested. So you have your case and anybody who fulfills those criteria that I uh, showed in the slide uh, of, of what is a close contact within two meters uh, contact, those people, once we have our confirmed case, are required to self-isolate at home for 14 days and self-monitor uh, for well and monitor for symptoms and that will be actually done by a healthcare professional and if they are symptomatic they get tested but it's only the context of the case so it's very important if, if a person is a contact of a contact they are not a risk to the community and there is no specific public health measure and the justification for this is if we have a case and they have a contact then that contact is completely healthy um, the, the, the chance of them transmitting on the virus in the asymptomatic state is exceptionally low. Now this contact is actually being asked also to self-isolate uh, from the community. Um, and so anyone who's, and so people who've contacted them during the asymptomatic period, they really have an incredibly low risk of, of having acquired the infection from a healthy person who, who may well not even have uh, the infection. So we are not recommending any uh, interventions for contacts of contacts. It is only people who have directly contacted the case. Remember, all of the contacts of the case 
will be followed up actively to develop to see if they develop signs and symptoms. And if they become a case, we'll immediately do a track back on all of their contacts and isolate uh, those contacts. And and we are helped by the relatively long incubation period of the disease. So so. Um, the, the, the chance of, of, of really a, a person who was a contact of a contact becoming ill before that original, the, the contact uh, develops any symptoms is, is vanishingly low. Again, this recommendation is really in line with all global recommendations. There's no basis for following up contacts of contacts. It's really only the close contacts of the case. Should any of those contacts become ill with the virus, then we will do a ring around their contacts and, and that's how it goes. Um, then let's just see. Uh, I'm just trying to get this thing to move. Okay. Um, okay, we, we don't have PPEs as GPs. What to do now? That is something I, I don't have a specific answer for on this call. I think PPE, there's a global shortage, um, and, and there, there are real challenges uh, with PPE. Um, and I, I actually don't have a solution for you now on the PPE question. I know the Department of Health are, are working at trying to get a, a supply, um, certainly for, for the initial outbreak response. Um, I think you, you know, you'll have to, to trial your supplies. And this is something that's a, a key point. I can, I can, there's a group in our team that are working on PPE, so, so we can try and, and work on this. Uh, if you do have relationships with private hospitals, uh, the private hospitals have secured uh, supplies and you, you could perhaps reach out to them to somehow access it. Um, I also know there's some efforts to get a local South African manufacturer up and running, um, but, but that is a real uh, a challenge. And then there's a question about masks, N95 masks. So just to, to touch on the mask issue, surgical masks are, are recommended, not for the general population at all. If you have a case who's coughing, they can use a surgical mask and that will reduce their, their chances of spreading the virus on because it catches a lot of the droplets that they may be expectorating. Um, if you are doing normal routine care of the patient, a surgical mask is fine. If you are doing an aerosol generating procedure, which does include taking of a nasopharyngeal swab, you should use an N95 uh, mask. Um, is there a separate contact for private patients? I'm not sure what that means. The NICD hotline is for private and public uh, patients. Uh, and I've got six more minutes, but I can go on a little bit longer. Eh? Uh, uh, the NICD hotline is for private and public uh, patients. It's available to everyone. Uh, if, you're, if you're a private patient, your sample should go to your private lab, and they will refer to us. The private pathologists are working very closely with us, and they do have all the information. Um, and, and if you do have a suspected case, it's fine for you to, to talk to your private pathologist. And if your private pathologist tells you you can go ahead, so long as you make sure you've got all the forms that we've said, you can see, and, and they say, that, they, they, that the patient meets the criteria, you can send the sample through. So we, we have limited capacity. We are inundated with calls. The private pathologists are working with us uh, to, to help uh, screen who is an appropriate admission. So if you have relationships with private pathologists in the private labs, feel free to consult them. And if they're happy to, to give advice, you can, based on their advice, send samples through to us. And as I say, some of those labs are going on. Um, also, they're going to be testing as well in time. So that'll be um, an additional resource for you. Okay, people are asking for the video to be made available. Normal packaging, so the question about triple packaging, normal packaging as you would any other respiratory swab for a viral screen, no, no special uh, precautions. Um, and then, okay, a lot of issues around the N95 mask. So this I don't have answers to. I think we'll try and get a team working on, on some advice for clinicians out there about N95. Mask, advice to people traveling. Okay, so, so that's very important. We have no um, travel restrictions recommended for South Africans. However, um, you know, I, I get inundated with questions about travel. I think there are, there are a number of different uh, risks associated with travel. The, the Probably the most likely risk associated with travel is extreme travel disruptions potentially, and even, I suppose, the theoretical possibility that should you travel to a country where there's suddenly a widespread outbreak, you could be caught up in a quarantine and not be able to uh, return home. So, so what I always say to people uh, wherever they're traveling is, is it really essential travel? I think at this time, uh, it's only sensible for anyone to reconsider travel because of the substantial uh, potential inconvenience. Um, there also is clearly uh, an increased chance of picking up the virus um, you know, in, in airports and also in, in, depending on where you're going in the country of origin. Um, but, but probably that's depending on where you're going to the epicenter, you know, or areas where there's 
where there's ongoing community transmission, um, that risk is probably relatively low, um, but, but, but not uh, absent. So I think all travel at this time, and I think everyone is doing this, should, should be carefully considered in terms of the, the risks and benefits. And the major risk is firstly inconvenience um, or, or being caught up and, and, and stuck somewhere. And then also a, a, probably a smaller risk of, of acquiring the infection. Now, if you're thinking of traveling to Wuhan or traveling to, to the northern part of Italy, which is under lockdown, you know, that you should seriously reconsider. So, so I think, um, you know, people, obviously it's sensible not to go to an area where there's widespread community transmission where you stand a higher risk of, of contracting uh, the virus. Uh, but as I said, that's evolving uh, rapidly, so, so people need to really check uh, what's going on um, in terms of this. Um, protocol for dentists, okay, so I'm just making notes. So we need PPE for GPs. Protocol for dentists, we, we, we can work on developing uh, some guidance uh, for dentists. Uh, clearly that's a need, there's more than one question about this. Um, Okay, uh, do we anticipate the presentation to differ in advanced HIV population? Very, very good uh, question. So there is no data about um, uh, how this virus presents in HIV infected people. Um, as I said, we know more severe illness in people with underlying uh, diseases. Um, how that will manifest in HIV is, is unclear. There's a theoretical possibility if the main pathogenesis is a cytokine storm, I suppose it could be milder in HIV, but that's probably less likely. It's more likely that, that uh, this virus will behave like other respiratory pathogens, pneumococcus, influenza, and will likely be associated with increased severity uh, in HIV-infected individuals. What we do know is that HIV-infected individuals who are well suppressed on antiretroviral treatment, this treatment will substantially reduce that or, or uh, mitigate that increased risk of severe disease. So it doesn't entirely eliminate the risk that they could, could get severe disease. So even people on ALTs would have a slight increased risk compared to the general population, but that increased risk is much less than, than people who are severely immunosuppressed. So, so the hope is uh, that certainly for those people on treatment, that the risk, increased risk, if any, would be, would be uh, relatively modest. For severely immunosuppressed individuals, we don't know, but clearly it is a concern um, that, that, that the disease could be more severe in this population, and similarly for the tuberculosis infected individuals. And certainly, um, you know, at NICD, we have an applied research agenda. So, so you know, as we control the outbreak, we'll, we'll try and generate data uh, you know, on the key questions that are needed for, for South Africa that maybe can only be answered locally uh, and not internationally. And looking at, at HIV and TB as, as risk factors for severe illnesses is at the top of our, our agenda. Um, but currently, there's no... Uh, data on this question. So I think we have to go from what we know about other, uh, other respiratory pathogens and, and treat them as a potential high risk group. Okay, air pollution, again, that's a theoretical concern. Um, maybe not so much in Italy though. I think, uh, you know, there's a, a large body of evidence that, that air pollution certainly can, can affect the, the severity of, of, of uh, respiratory illness um, and, and if, especially if it causes underlying lung disease, but no specific data on this virus and air pollution. Um, is treatment simply supportive? So really, that's a fantastic question. I didn't go through the treatment slides, and the reason is because the treatment is supportive. So I didn't want to spend, so no steroids and treat as any other pneumonia. So, so there are no specific antivirals. There are uh, antivirals in clinical trials. Um, so so there, there's, a, there's a two antiretrovirals that are in clinical trials and, and other new uh, antivirals that have been tested in, in SARS and MERS that are in clinical trials um, in China and now in other countries, there's actually what's called a global clinical trial protocol that, that any country that starts having cases can use and enroll people into this global international clinical trial. It has been said that over the next few weeks, initial results may come out from these clinical trials on the effectiveness of specific antivirals. But um, we all are very comfortable or commonly treat patients who may have a viral pneumonia for which there are no specific antivirals. And so you treat as any other pneumonia and that's mostly respiratory support um, in terms of, of oxygen ventilation. There are detailed slides on the clinical management and there is details in our, if you go to our website, there's a, the guidelines. There's also information on the, the, the clinical management. Uh, also, um, it's not really good information, but as with any other viral infection, um, you know, we, we Currently, the, the thinking is that there is a risk of bacterial superinfection, and so you would give antibiotics as you would for any other viral infection. If you think there's any suggestion of bacterial superinfection, you should use your antibiotics in the same way. So no specific antivirals. The treatment is really as you would for any, um, uh, any uh, viral pneumonia, and there are detailed information uh, on our, our website. Um, 
Are private facilities allowed to admit positive patients? Absolutely, we're working very closely in partnership with the private uh, sector. Um, and should a patient uh, be uh, admitted already in a private facility when they are diagnosed as positive, they will be kept uh, in that private facility if the private facility is happy to keep the patient. And the, many of the private hospital groups have really excellent, fantastic uh, plans for how they're going to manage the coronavirus cases. If a case is, is however, mildly ill and they're, they're being admitted uh, rather because they're confirmed as a case, then they would be referred to, to the designated uh, facility in the public sector in the province. So, so we're going to avoid moving the patients around unnecessarily. If they're in a private facility and the private facility is happy to, to continue managing them, we will leave them there for care, um, uh, but, but we won't be referring pay, people into the private sector if they're not already there. Effectiveness of UV light, I don't know about um, okay so there's a question about climate and temperature I think that that's not known it's a hypothetical possibility we can hope for if the warm weather uh, prevents the spread of the virus but but it's not known many respiratory viruses do have winter seasonality but it's not known about this virus there are some that have a more of a summer uh, seasonality so issues of environment um, and temperature uh, we, uh, yeah, we don't uh, have good uh, information. So what about the winter season? I think, so again, as I said, seasonality is not clear um, whether it will be worse in the winter. I think for South Africa, uh, the concern is that, uh, as I've mentioned, the big concern with a, a virus like this is overwhelming of the health uh, system. And we know in the flu season, we see a real big bump up in, in admissions and hospital occupancy. And so there is, a, again, a theoretical, uh, well, not a theoretical concern, an actual concern that should the epidemic coincide with the flu season, that would uh, exacerbate the, the uh, pressure on the health system. And so, so that is a concern for South Africa. Europe is trying to push it out beyond their flu season but we are coming up to our flu season. Uh, that's something, it's not clear, uh, you know, how we should deal with it because, um, you know, we also don't want to encourage the spread of the disease. So, so I think we do have to hope uh, that, that the, the, the outbreak comes either before or after the flu season, but this is also something that we, we are, are going to engage with the World Health Organization and other international experts, uh, you know, about are there special measures for Southern Hemisphere countries as the, the virus now spreads more globally. So not only us, but also uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, South America, all in a similar situation. So, so I think we, we'll engage with World Health Organization about specific guidance for how we manage um, the upcoming flu season. But one thing that's very, very important, you should encourage your patients to have the flu vaccine. Uh, so, so it's available for the risk groups through the Department of Health, um, like HIV infected people, pregnant women, the, the elderly. Um, but even if people are not in, in risk groups, if they are healthy, we really strongly advise them to have the flu vaccine because it presents very similar to coronavirus and you don't want to be erroneously identified as a coronavirus case and isolated unnecessarily when you have the flu. So, so really we recommend uh, people should have the flu virus if they do have the uh, access uh, to the virus. Um, the more about treatment, I think currently we, 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 there are no specific treatment protocols um, as yet. At what point will they declare it a pandemic? So that I can, can't say. Um, I think there is a community transmission in multiple areas of the world, which, which does match with the World Health Organization uh, definition of a pandemic. I think there is a concern that there's already so much global panic that if they declare it a pandemic, it's also up the, the, the panic. Uh, but I do think whether or not the World Health Organization uh, declare, declares it or you know, gives it a name of a pandemic. I think in terms of South Africa and how we manage our response and how we plan, um, you know, we, we will base that based on the evidence on the ground about what's happening uh, in terms of transmission and the risks to South Africa and, and the up-to-date data rather than whether they name it as a pandemic or not. So for us in South Africa, you know, it doesn't matter what the, the WHO, if they call it a pandemic or not, we are monitoring and constantly evaluating, you know, how is the spread globally? What is the effectiveness of, of containment? What is the new data about mitigation, about treatment, et cetera? Um, okay, so in a rural district hospital, a lot of sick people with acute respiratory symptoms with no travel history. Um, and should these be tested for severe pneumonia of unknown etiology? So this is a, a, a judgment call. I think, uh, you know, we do expect that most likely that the severe pneumonia of unknown etiology is really uh, to, to, to increase the sensitivity of our case definition to pick up a mixed case. I think if you have a person who's got HIV, who's got clear, strong risk factors, for a pneumonia, and they look really like a typical HIV-associated pneumonia, I think there's no reason to see in the sample because that's not unexplained et etiology. Um, I think it's more the unusual case, healthy young person, 
uh, person who's, who's, who's got pneumonia but traveled maybe not to one of the risk countries. Um, so, so, so I think the typical pneumonia patient that we see every day with very strong underlying risk factors, whether they're very elderly or they have HIV or they have COPD, those ones we don't really need to be testing. But anyone, if there's any kind of suggestion in your mind that there's something a bit atypical about this pneumonia, rather test. Now, if, if you're worried at all, we are happy to test from patients with pneumonia. So we're not closing the door on testing, but I don't think, um, you know, if, you, if you're going to be testing people, then you need to be managing them also as persons under investigation. And I think, you know, the, the, the HIV-infected pneumonias, we, we, we are really inundated with them. And I think um, all of those individuals who are more typical pneumonias, um, they, are, they are less likely to, to be the, the indicator for, for, for this virus. Um, but, but as I say, if a patient has pneumonia, you're at all worried, you're very welcome. To, to send it through. What is our testing capacity? Um, I think we, we, we expand in the capacity uh, according to the need. Currently, we test uh, 20 to 40 uh, per day. We do have capacity to expand more. And as I've mentioned, there is a plan to roll out testing more, more widely throughout the country. So we, we hope that there will not be a bottleneck um, with uh, testing. Um, Pediatric patients, children screened, we are not screening healthy asymptomatic people. There's no community transmission and children should only be tested if they, um, if they uh, meet the, the case definition. I think you, we should reassure all of our patients and that's one thing I have children. It's one thing that's very reassuring to say that children really seem to be relatively uh, less affected than in fact with normal uh, 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 respiratory disease, cost to state of testing, I don't, don't know that, but cost to you, is no, there's no cost to, to the patient if they meet our case definition. Um, I think we've got just time for one. Okay, there are a lot of questions about cost of the sample. Uh, so, so the cost of transport to the sample in the private sector, I don't have an answer on, but you should, if you work with a private laboratory, um, should you, you should liaise with them about exactly um, uh, which, uh, you know, what they're going to charge before they just charge the patient. And you can do that now. You can ask the private lab, what will you charge us to transfer uh, the patient to the NICD? And the very last question I'm going to take is, um, will you apply complete immunity once recovered from coronavirus? There is no data on this, but if we look at almost every other respiratory illness, after you've, you've recovered from the infection, um, you would have had a strong immune response and the likelihood of being uh, reinfected within the same season would be exceptionally low. So that is what we are working on. There have been occasional uh, reports, not so much in the published literature, but in the sort of, uh, you know, informal literature that, that there have been people who've been reinfected, but the most of those were debunked as rather false negative tests. So, so the current thinking is it is likely that uh, you will have immunity uh, to the infection if you're infected, at least in the first season, but there's no evidence really about more broad immunity, herd immunity, um, and those things. And of course, those are critical public health questions. Um, and, and so I think we, we're out of time. Um, and I, unfortunately, I would have been very nice to take, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one questions. Um, I hope the, the talk has been interesting and informative. It will be made available on the NRCD website and you can, can download it uh, through the ECHO. I think clearly this presentation has shown that there's a huge demand and interest um, in these talks, and so we will schedule uh, another one in, in the future. Um, and I see a lot of questions about the clinical management. Um, I didn't go into that so much because it is mostly supportive, and also um, I'm uh, primarily an, an epidemiologist and, and microbiologist, um, but I think what we'll try to do is, is get an infectious diseases uh, physician um, you know, to, to do one of these talks as well, and we'll publicize that widely uh, through, through our channels, um, you know, which maybe can focus more on, on the clinical uh, aspects um, of, of management of the case. Also, if we do it in a couple of weeks, hopefully there'll be results of those clinical trials um, on the specific antivirals that are available. And, and if that is the case, um, you know, then you could also have some hot off the press information about, about specific treatment. And, and lastly, just to thank, thank everyone. I think it's wonderful that there's such a huge uh, interest um, in, in the, the disease, hopefully it's been informative. If you have uh, critical questions that haven't been answered, um, and if you do have cases and you, you're not clear what to do, please do contact the, the NICD hotline. Uh, just uh, you know, being aware that, that, that it is for health professionals and we're really overwhelmed with calls. So, so please do direct your, your um, patients to the public hotline. Um, and the public hotline, I don't, I don't know if I, I can't remember if I showed it in the presentation, but it's on the NICD website, that number. So direct your patients to the public hotline and keep our clinician, clinician hotline for, for doctors um, and healthcare workers, nurses, pharmacists, any healthcare worker can phone our clinical hotline uh, to get advice. And thank you very much.